Colin Callender, uh, you're an executive producer of Wolf Hall, which is nominated for eight Emmys, including Best Limited Series this year. Uh, a lot of us were expecting it to do well in the nominations. Uh, but was that something you were an anxiously anticipating, or do you try not to think about that sort of thing? Well, you know, when you make something, you don't, you, you're not thinking about the awards per se, but you always hope that the community, the you know, your community of peers will recognize your work. And, you know, the miniseries is a form that's unique to television. There's no other venue in which you can tell uh, a complex and interesting characters drama over six hours. And, you know, Wolf Hall is that. And, um, you know, I, I, I think if the audience stays and watches the whole thing, watches the full six hours, you get a chance to have a story told that, you know, you couldn't find anywhere else. And, uh, you know, Wolf Hall tells the story of uh, Henry VIII and, and Anne Boleyn, uh, and, you know, which, which has been told uh, many times before in film and, and TV and, and, and stage, but, but not usually through the point of view of Thomas Cromwell as we get it in Wolf Hall. Uh, do you think he brings a unique perspective to the whole story? I think that's what makes the story interesting. I mean, when the book came out and I read it, I thought, well, there's, there have been a lot of dramas about the Tudors, but this what's different about this one is a character who's normally a sort of two-dimensional villain lurking in the wings in most stories about the, the Tudors. This character is put center stage, and you look at the world from a completely different point of view. Um, and the story is sort of, you know, it's, you know, the, the, the foxes at Sears Empire, that's what this story is about. It's about, it's about power, it's about the, the, the lust for power, it's about the exercise of power, it's about money, it's about, it's, about, uh, it's, it's about betrayal, it's about loyalty. And it's all seen through the perspective, not of the king and the queen, but through the person that works for him, um, his lieutenant. And that's a new perspective. And that's what Mark Rylance's performance is all about, is looking at a man who every day is trying to, on the one hand, do the right thing, and yet on the other hand, survive, and survive a world where if you misstep, um, you, you don't get fired, you have your head cut off. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the interesting things about uh, Thomas Cromwell. As you said, we do often see him as sort of a, a villainous figure in, in, in other places he's depicted. But, but here he doesn't seem to come off to me as, as a hero or a villain per se, but as you said, more of a survivor. Uh, did you have a strong familiarity you know, with his history uh, before you know, the miniseries and before the books? Well, I'm glad you said that, actually, because I think one of the points we will try, one of the great things that's interesting about this drama is there aren't any clear heroes or villains. Everybody is constantly straddling that moral line between, as I say, uh, pragmatism on the one hand and idealism on the other. And although it's a story about people that lived 500 years ago, it's a story that's every bit as relevant to the world we live in today. And um, so I think that's what makes it so interesting and of the moment. And, uh, and you mentioned uh, you know, Mark Rylance uh, playing uh, Thomas Cromwell, uh, and he's well known for, for especially his stage work. He's a three-time Tony winner. Uh, and, and this is such a, a, a reserved kind of uh, uh, internal performance in, in some ways. He, he doesn't you know, wear a lot of emotions on his sleeve necessarily. Uh, you know, what, what, tell me what you think made him right for, for this role. Well, you know, most good actors can play one or two emotions at the same time. Great actors can maybe play two or three emotions at the great time at the same time. Mark Rylance can play dozens of emotions at the same time. He can play all these contradictory things. So part of the great uh, impact of his performance is you're never quite sure where you are. You're never quite sure whether he's, he's, he's about to say something really terrible or he's, whether he's actually going to be, uh, whether he's actually going to sort of keep his mouth shut. Uh, and, and he performs that brilliantly. And I think the fact that he's a stage actor and has had all this experience on stage, he brings to the screen a sort of a craft, uh, an acting, a new, an ability to, to, to explore nuance uh, in, his, in his performance, which is qu quite sort of quite extraordinary. I mean, in many ways, he is like Frank, this character is Frank Underwood. This, this character is, you know, he, he could be uh, Walter White in, in Breaking Bad. He, he, he is uh, like so many contemporary characters on, on television at the moment. He, he, he's a he's he's a very complex man, um, and he's not your traditional hero, but nor is he a villain at all. If you see the last frame of the last episode of episode six, 
I think the ending of episode six, which is a glorious episode, by the way. In fact, if people had watched it, then Claire Foy, would, there's no question in my mind, Claire Foy would have been nominated for Best, Best Supporting Actress. But episode six has an ending that is every bit as compelling as the final shot of The Sopranos. The ending of, and don't, let's not spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but the ending of episode six of the whole miniseries is a glorious, bold ending that really speaks to the question of this man's character and who he is. Um, and uh, I, I think it, in one single shot, um, the full six hours is sort of all comes to a glorious conclusion. Yeah, I, I do remember that. That there's a very memorable last shot. You mentioned the Sopranos. It also almost feels like you know, sort of almost the Godfather in in a, in a certain way. That you know, and and you know, I remember after the last shot, which you know, I won't reveal you know the specifics of what happens in that last moment. Uh, but you know, it, it I. I went and looked him up because I, you know, I wasn't too familiar with, with Thomas Cromwell and seeing what his future was after the events, uh, you know, that are covered in, in the miniseries. I'm like, Oh, you can, you can almost see the a foreshadowing there too. Well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But we won't, we, but we won't be spoilers here and say any more about that, but it is, it is worth, it is worth watching that episode because that episode does really uh, explore the very, you know, the, this, this complex moral equation that you were just referring to earlier on. And, uh, and then you have, uh, of course, uh, uh, Damien Lewis, who's playing uh, Henry VIII, which is one of the most famous, you know, roles in film, television, stage. Uh, you know, what do you think? You know, he was able to bring to to this role that was that was unique. Well, it, you know, it was very bold of Damien to go from Homeland, that big iconic role, a contemporary role. Um, very, very different, and go from that, and the next thing you see him on screen is he's playing Henry VIII. I mean, I, you have to admire the guy, the guy's, uh, uh, you know, cojones. It was, it was, as an actor, it was a very, very bold move. Now he was in the company of, uh, you know, Mark Rylance and and uh, Jonathan Price and a whole, whole glorious set of actors. I think that, um, you know, Damien comes from one of those English public schools called Eton. Um, it's 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 a very grand posh school, and um, you know he he has he has in real life a certain demeanor, a glorious quality about him, which is you know he's very charismatic in real life, and he carries himself with great confidence and great aplomb. Um, and he, and he, in some ways, you know that that I think, and he he admitted this at some point in a press conference. His own background, in some senses, helped him understand a bit about who Henry VIII was. But we are meeting in this. We are meeting Henry VIII before the usual um, renditions of him. He was a sportsman. He was a poet. Um, he was very charismatic. Um, but but he, the thing for Henry VIII was it, the country had just come out of a civil war that had gone on for many, many years, the War of the Roses. And his desire to have a son wasn't just, what wasn't just sort of male, uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a question of sort of pride. He wanted to protect the uh, future of the monarchy and avoid the country going back into civil war. So having a son wasn't just vanity, it was actually his duty as the king to maintain uh, uh, peace in England. The irony, of course, is that his one daughter, Elizabeth, turned out to be maybe the greatest king or queen the country England ever had, Elizabeth I. But of course, they didn't know that at the time. Uh, the miniseries was adapted from uh, the books by uh, Hilary Mantel, uh, and in addition to the miniseries, they were actually also adapted into a stage play uh, that were actually nominated for several Tonys this year. Uh, were, were the stage and screen versions, you know, developed completely independently of each other? Yes, they were. They were a, a pure coincidence. Um, we actually got the green light from the BBC to produce this before the RSC's production, the Royal Shakespeare Company's production, was in the works. Um, but through a bizarre coincidence of timing, both uh, the miniseries are, and the, 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 uh, the stage production were unveiled at the same time, um, so within the same week, bizarrely. But it's pure coincidence, and the productions actually were quite different. Um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the stage production and the television productions, someone's going to write a graduate thesis sometime about the adapting of books to television and the stage and use Hillary, uh, he, he use Wolf Hall as, as, as a subject. And it's, it's, a, it's certainly a unique sort of thing. You don't usually get a chance to see the same story told at the same time, you know, for, for stage and well, screen. Funny, funny enough, I have a history of this, bizarrely, because <laughs> I won my first Emmy with something called Nicholas Nickleby, 
Um, it was in a year that we were up against the winds of war with Robert Mitchum and the thorn birds with Richard Chamberlain. And here was, a, I, I had produced uh, Nicholas Nickleby, which was a nine hour mini series um, based on a sta nine hour stage play by the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and while we were making the show, and while, what, excuse me, while the show was airing in America, it, the, the actual stage play was performed, uh, you know, was being performed uh, on Broadway. So I've had, um, I, I've had um, this experience before. Now we were lucky then because we were the, we were the sort of outsiders, and uh, and obviously both Thornbirds and Winds of War were the big, the, were, the, were, the, were the big favourites. But we nipped in under the wire and be, uh, and were, we uh, stole their thunder. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, and you yourself have uh, you know done theater work. Uh, you won a Tony uh, last year for producing the Hedwig and the Angry Inch revival. Uh, in general, uh, how is it, the experience of producing for the stage different from producing for film or television? Well, in one sense, it's not different at all. I mean, what you're looking for is a story that, that, that that's compelling and captivating, that engages, and that's relevant, and that has something to say about the world we live in uh, today, and so will engage audiences. That That's... That's all the same. The actual experience of making things are very different. This was shot entirely on location for 85 days, all over the southwest of England. Um, it was a hot, you know, it, it was like it was like having a a, a massive uh, sort of moving caravan of 150 people across the country. It was it was quite, it was quite an endeavour, you know. But when you when you're doing a stage play, you're getting immediate audience feedback, and the, the, uh, the you know you, you're constantly fine tuning. While you're while it's still being performed, of course that doesn't happen um, uh, in a movie. And I think for Mark Rylance, who who gives a glorious performance in this, um, I think at first he, because he's used to working on the stage, I think working on a film set uh, at the beginning was was, was quite a, a, a sort of overwhelming experience. Uh, he soon, he's very quickly um, got you know got into the rhythm of it all. But I, th I think that. Part, part of what's special about what he does on the screen here and why I think his performance is so extraordinary is that, you know, he, he, he has had that experience of, of, of working on stage and knew it, and, and then going on to coming to, you know, working on the cat with the camera. Um, he was able to sort of intuitively understand how an audience responds to certain moments, albeit bringing it down in size for the camera rather than for the audience in the theater. Uh, you know, the, the miniseries is based on, on two novels by, by Hilary Mantel, and uh, there's uh, going to be a third book that covers, uh, you know, the rest of, of Cromwell's story. Uh, and you've said you're interested in, in developing that into another series. You know, are, are there any updates on how that's developing? Do you have people like spies just hovering to wait for that manuscript? Or <laughs> we, we do. We we have a man. We have someone actually locally who lives near Henry Mantel who is stealing her garbage and actually pulling through all the papers to see what she's written. Um, no, she's writing the third book as we speak. And everybody involved, uh, for, you know, in, in Warfall, Mark Rylands and the, the Steve, Peter Strawn and Peter Kosminski, the, the writer and director, everyone's on standby um, for when she delivers the book to, 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 to get on with uh, the, 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 the sort of the next mini series based on, the, on, on her next book. Uh, you know, before this, you uh, uh, recently produced uh, another, you know, historical drama, the the White Queen, which was about another very dark chapter in royal history. Uh, it, 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 watching both of these stories, it strikes me that while we're dealing with like the top levels of wealth and power in in, in England, it's also incredibly dangerous to to be among the wealthy and powerful at the, at this time. You know, do you think in some ways it would have been safer to be a commoner during that period, or, or is it just a different kind of hardship? Well, that's very interesting. You should ask that question because the point about Thomas Cromwell is was he was a commoner. He was not born of wealth. It is the story. In some senses, it's a very American story. He's a story. It's the story of a man who comes from very lowly background and through his wit and his intelligence and his smarts and his survival skills he manages to climb to the very heights of, of, of the royal court so um, what's interesting is the story of a working class man it is the story of, a, of, a, of an ordinary man who, who who works his way into those power circles and part of the challenge he has is that the landed gentry of the time the snobs, the the, the, the aristocrats, um, that they look down on him and think he's a peon, and they, they don't take him seriously because he's you know he's not of their class. And part of the drama and part of what motivates him is just that. So um, that's that's what's interesting about the story. And of course, the White Queen dramatized the story of the, the Civil War that precedes this period that may that that, that, that informs the whole. 
context of the, of the story of Wolf Hall. Uh, you know, besides you know the you know the work you've been producing lately, I mean, you've been a, a major player in in the entire landscape of of TV movies and miniseries. You know, for for quite a while, you were the president of uh, HBO Films for you know during kind of an amazing period for for HBO. I mean, you know, Angels in America, John Adams, The Pacific, and just to name a few. Uh, what was the process of of deciding projects at HBO Films? It, it seems like it must have been an embarrassment of riches. You know, it, it was a very exciting time. It really was. Um, it was before the advent of Netflix and Amazon and, uh, and Hulu. It was, you know, HBO um, was the sort of insurgent uh, running around all the incumbents. Uh, and we would take risks and uh, it was it was great fun. We made a big commitment to the miniseries. We made at the height of the, the height of the, uh, my time there, you know, between eight and ten single dramas a year. Um, and, it, you know, I, I think it was there that w we learned the, the idea that you can tell smart and intelligent stories um, and still be entertaining and, 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 and still be, uh, you know, embrace the sort of the showbiz of it all, the show, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, the excitement of it all while do actually doing something intelligent and, and, and smart. And, you know, I, I think that was the, one of the great takeaways. Are there uh, any projects during, there are so many obviously to choose from, but are there any projects that stand out for you, you know, during that time uh, that, that you're especially proud of looking back? Well, in some, in some ways, you know, John Adams was a model for, for, for Wolf Hall. When I met Hilary Mantel, um, who, who wrote the books Wolf Hall, which incidentally we should, we should acknowledge, uh, won two literary prizes, the Booker Prizes. I mean, they're very, they're, 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 you know, apart from being best-selling novels, they, they were um, highly uh, awarded uh, critically in, in literary circles. Uh, I mean, what, what she really did with Wolf Hall was she took a sort of stuffy historical drama and she shook the cobwebs out of it um, and she sort of reinvigorated the historical novel. And we wanted to do the same thing with Wolf Hall in television. We wanted to take a genre, a historical television drama that we've seen before, turn it upside down, shake all the cobwebs out of it and reinvigorate it. We did that, I think, in John Adams. That was what was exciting about John Adams. You saw you were with John Adams and Abigail Adams in the moment with them when things were taking place. You did; they didn't know. He didn't know whether or not um, these thirteen states, uh, were, 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 you know, were going the, 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 the new the, the, the people, the signatories to the Declaration, Declaration of Independence, were, were going to succeed or be hung by. Uh, as traitors by the British, just as Thomas Cromwell doesn't know minute to minute whether what he's going to do, um, breaking from Rome, the church in Rome, um, and so on and so forth, is going to result in you know success or not. And so that idea of being in the moment as you tell the story with the characters not knowing, not having the benefit of historical hindsight, that was part of the approach to Wolf Fall, and that was very much at the center of um, John Adams. I'd say, you know, you know, the last 20 years, certainly, you know, and now especially with the advent of, of, of streaming and, and, you know, things like Netflix and, and Amazon getting into this now, uh, you know, the, the, the output, the creative output we're seeing, you know, I feel like it, it rivals or and sometimes surpasses the, the kind of work that, that's happening on the big screen uh, these days. Does it feel like TV is, is a more fertile ground for, for you know, projects like this and, and interesting ideas like this, you know, especially these days? I think so. I really do. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's, you can, you can tell, as I said before, you know, really smart, you can spend time, what you can do with the miniseries, which is so much fun, is you can spend time with the character. You can really let the, you can really explore character and relationships in complex ways that you can't do when you've got a, a, a two hour movie and you've got to address the dictates of, you know, of, of the you know, a three act structure or whatever uh, for a single drama. So you, you're liberated in this mini series form to tell a more complex, involved story with the character. And I think Wolf Hall, I think what's most interesting about what you've said and about the new world is, 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 is the sort of the way people are binge viewing. And, and you know, and, and just watching hour after hour, and certainly Wolf Hall is one of those great stories that you know you could spend your whole Sunday night, you know, starting at six and ending at midnight, watching the whole thing. And, and, and you know, you really, you really do feel if you do that, that you, you've actually been transported somewhere else. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think I actually consumed it over like two or three days over a weekend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's fun. It's fun. 
Well, I, I want to, you know, congratulate you uh, on, again on the miniseries uh, and its Emmy nominations and, and best of luck on those uh, in September and, and best of luck also uh, with, with uh, hopefully the, the sequel that will, that will uh, be on its way uh, uh, sooner than later. Thank you. That's right. Great conversation. Thank you for your time.